So one thing right off the bat, before we get too deep into this topic, and we're going pretty deep today, I want to start with a worry that I have for this video and kind of for the channel in general. I feel like this topic and a lot of other gear topics I release give off the impression that you need expensive gear or a great room in order to make music. The reality is you need a very, very small amount of gear and you need a lot of talent to make good music. So gear and recording environment can definitely be important, but the talent of the performer, the skill of the production, all of that is so much more important than that. We're gonna go through a lot of nitty gritty stuff today, but I'm telling you right now, before we get into all of that, as audio engineers, as much as we obsess over all of those things, it is much more about capturing the proper performance. Take me for example. It's kind of ironic that I'm teaching you about room environments in what is essentially an untreated room. My last one was even worse. That one, I was backed up to a glass door in a tiled room with a way more reflective environment. And all of it was completely on a, a really busy street too. And I really thought no one would like my videos and especially the audio, it admittedly sucked, but not to toot my own horn or anything, but what really mattered was how I was delivering the information and how well I conveyed my message. That's what's important when you're talking about audio education. The content and the production of that content was way more important than the environment I was doing the content in. Take that lesson from this video as well. If you're so far removed from being able to achieve the things I'm talking about in this video, please make music anyways. Don't get turned away by your lack of gear or a lack of a proper environment. As someone who exists in essentially one of the least proper environments possible, the loudest city in the world is just beyond that wall, I'm telling you, Please continue to make your art no matter what. With that rant over, why don't we get started on this topic? We'll start pretty unscientific, but we're gonna quickly get into some pretty nitty gritty stuff. And hey, none of this would matter if you don't worry about publishing your music in the first place. And to talk about that, we're gonna talk about our sponsor, DistroKid. As I've said throughout this entire month, DistroKid is about publishing your music and getting it heard by everyone out there. They do that through one of the largest selections of streaming services possible. I guarantee you 99% of you are going to be listening on all of the streaming platforms that you can publish your music on as well. All of that for only $20 a year. And not only that, they offer so many other things besides just publishing your music. All right, my camera died, so welcome to a slightly different image quality. So we've talked about a bunch of different ways that DistroKid is more than just a music publication service. One of the craziest ones was that you can actually get your music in front of major labels like Republic Records for free. But this one I wanna talk about today is called Spotify Canvas. And do you know those vertical videos that you see when you're listening to music on Spotify? I thought that was like exclusive for major artists, but turns out you can do that through DistroKid. You can use DistroKid and Spotify Canvas together in order to upload that video for yourself. Really all the tools that you need to look really professional are available with DistroKid only for 20 bucks a year. It's insane. It's a tool that I recommend to all artists and most artists already use it. So if you're not, I highly recommend you do so. You can use this link if you'd like in order to get a discount and support the channel. Okay, so let's talk about the simplest method possible. Things that you could use if you didn't have any money to spend on treatment at all. Clutter, mess, disorganization, everything that your mom would hate you for. Reflections love right angles and they love flat, smooth surfaces. So any way that you can disrupt and break apart these sound waves before they get to these right angles and these smooth surfaces, that is gonna do a lot for your sound, surprisingly so. Take my room, for example. It's not great, it's not actually formally treated, but there's a bike on the wall, there's guitars everywhere, there's a desk in the middle, there's a rug covering most of the floor, there's a queen bed in it, there's clutter everywhere. I live in a studio apartment in Brooklyn, it's tiny. This all makes for actually a pretty good acoustically treated room. It's not acoustically dead, but we're gonna get to later why you might actually not want that. Again, we're gonna get a little bit deeper now. We're gonna increase in complexity. Let's talk about where these frequencies usually end up in your room. Namely, I'm sure many of you know this, in the corners. Low end frequencies tend to collect in the corners. They actually bounce around and resonate in the corners, so they're actually much louder there than they would be in other parts of the room. If you don't believe me, 
go into the corner and yell at yourself or put a microphone up to the corner and yell in the middle of your room. High end frequencies tend to dissipate a little bit more evenly. It's really the low end and the low mid range that you have to worry about. But when thinking about placing yourself in the room for both mixing and performance, you have to consider where these reflections tend to lie, which are in the corners and another place is in the center of the room, any symmetrical center. So if your rooms are square, avoid the center. If you're in a long rectangle like myself, avoid the center of the rectangle. Okay, even deeper. This is kind of a weird thing to think about, but your room is an instrument. It sounds kind of weird, but your room has a sound. And I don't mean in like the sort of esoteric ways that producers walk into Abbey Road and they're like, oh, this is such a magical sounding space. Your room literally has a fundamental frequency. I'll show you what I mean. Okay, after this video, don't pause the video because I know you won't come back. I want you to go to amacoustics.com or just Google room frequency calculator. If your room isn't a rectangle, congrats. Your problem just got way harder than everyone else's. Okay, so check this out. This is really cool. At the top here, I've entered in the dimensions of my room. And what you're left with are the frequencies that make up the resonances in my room. You can see the lowest fundamental frequency in my room is 15 hertz, which is actually outside of the range of human hearing. But the next frequency that's in the range of human hearing is 31 hertz. You can see they're both Bs. My room is in B. <laughs> you can then see as we go further up in what we call the harmonic series, we are getting more and more resonant frequencies. And if you look at the room in 3D at the bottom here, it shows you where those frequencies show up most prominently. There's not a difference between the red and the blue that's just for representational means. You can see here though, the A1 at 53 Hertz is showing up in the corners, which is where I was saying a lot of low end information ends up showing up. But as we get further through the harmonic series, a lot of these frequencies show up in a lot more complex ways because higher end information, even though this is still mostly low end, starts to disperse in more complex ways. But there are some general practices that we can take away from this. Clearly you wanna avoid the corners of the room and you wanna avoid the center of the room, like in this 30 Hertz example. Anything that starts to repeat in a little bit more of a predictable manner, that's where we wanna put our acoustic treatment or that's where we want to avoid. So technically where I am now, where I'm mixing now, which is kind of in the center of this room, is picking up a lot of 50 hertz. It's, it's really not a great place to be for mixing, but hey man, it's, it's a small room. I gotta live too. I do compensate for this a bit because the KRKs have a built-in high pass and I'm cutting a lot of the bass frequencies, but it's still gonna be a problem and I have to take that into account whenever I'm mixing. Now I do wanna point out one term here that you should keep in mind and that's called Schroeder frequency which I only know about vaguely, but I know enough to talk about. Schroeder frequency is kind of where the room resonances are going to be most dominant before they start to break apart. My Schroeder frequency in this room is around 146 Hertz. And if we look here, it's kind of a messy area to deal with. It's kind of hard to avoid some of this stuff. You can use diffusers and room absorption in order to get some of it out of the way, but high end frequencies are typically a lot more scattered. If forced to, I would focus on where you can focus your attention most, which are gonna be these concentrated low end and low mid range problem areas. So try and add acoustic treatment, whatever that means to you, whether it's a blanket or it's rock wool or it's the most advanced stuff you can find, try and add that in these areas in order to mitigate these builds up of low end frequencies and low mid range. Okay. Okay, let's go even further and let's talk about material and reflectivity. Lots of numbers coming at you and, and this is gonna blow your mind. Okay, so check this out. This is pretty cool. This is a bunch of different materials and also their coefficient of absorption. All you really need to know is the higher the value, the better they are at absorbing that frequency or more accurately, how well the sound penetrates that material. For example, let's go to an easy one to pick on, glass. Glass is terrible at absorbing frequencies. 125 Hertz, abysmal. Even worse up in mid range at four kilohertz. Now there's another thing I wanna point out too, which is people. <laughs> people are actually pretty good at absorbing sound. So if you have a lot of people in your space, you can expect them to absorb a lot of information, including a lot of mid range and pretty efficient at absorbing low end as well. Elementary school students are a little worse. High school students, pretty good. Only for absorption though, it would definitely bring down the quality of the space in general. Now, a lot of people use rock wool or fiberglass. Well, 
check out what fiberglass does. That's insane. So use this as a reference if you're looking to find, you know, materials on the cheap that you could use for your room. And remember, the goal here is not necessarily to achieve 0.999999 in everywhere. We don't want an acoustically dead space. We want an acoustically treated space. Absorbing all this information could bias your room in different ways. I'm going to go into that a little bit in the next section as well. I think I will end this by talking about two commonly misinterpreted vocab words diffusion and absorption. There are different methods of achieving both, but when it comes down to it, absorption literally refers to the absorption of those frequencies and diffusion breaks up that sound wave into smaller, less noticeable sound waves. For example, if you fill a studio with a bunch of absorption materials, let's take Markiplier here, no shade, it was just the first person I thought of, you can expect a significant reduction in high end. Why? Because polyurethane foam has a high coefficient of absorption of 0.86. It absorbs high-end information extremely well. Diffusion, on the other hand, is going to keep your room a little bit more lively, but more controlled than acoustically dead. Dispersing them in the room in a more controlled manner, in a less prominent manner, rather than actually absorbing the sound and taking frequencies out of the room. Hence why you might see diffusion panels along flat walls, where you might see absorption panels where you need to literally absorb excess low end, like bass traps. Okay, like I said, a lot to take in. A lot of rules. But as mentioned, as audio engineers, we're almost obsessed with making the perfect system. And if I'm honest, we're obsessed with making the perfect system at a much higher budget than is really necessary. Beyond all this, the most important thing is to capture a good performance and on the flip side, have the talent to capture a really good performance. Beginners, don't be intimidated by this. You can make amazing stuff with none of this. The last thing I want to do, even though I talk a ton about gear and a lot about audio rules on this channel, is to make you think that you need to have all these systems up and running to make anything of value. You don't need any of this. You just need a good song or you need a good audio project. Okay, I think that was a lot for this lesson. Thank you so much for watching. I'm sure there's a lot to discuss in the comments. If you'd like, you can follow me on Instagram here at Real Audio Haze. You can also work on a project with me by emailing me at realaudiohaze at gmail.com. Um, goodbye. <laughs>